Hello Magic Makers, welcome to Storytime with Mombirilla. This is a young adult fiction and may be inappropriate for some younger viewers. The Beast Within, A Tale of Beauty's Prince by Serena Valentino. Copyright, Disney Enterprises Incorporated, 2014. Dedicated to my dearest love, Shane Case. Chapter 1. The Witches in the Rose Garden. The Beast stood in his rose garden, the overwhelming scent of new blossoms making him slightly dizzy. His garden always seemed to have a life of its own, as if the twisting thorny vines could wrap themselves around his racing heart and put an end to his anxiety. There were times when he wished they would, but now his mind was filled with images of the beautiful young woman inside his castle. Belle, so brave and noble, willing to take her father's place as a prisoner in the castle dungeon. What sort of woman would do that, give up her life so easily, sacrificing her freedom for her father's. The beast wondered if he was capable of such a sacrifice. He wondered if he was capable of love. He stood there looking at the view of his castle from the garden. He tried to recall how the castle had looked before the curse. It was different now, menacing and alive. Even the spires of his castle seemed to consciously pierce the sky with a violent fervor. He could only imagine how the place looked from a distance. It was tall and imposing, and perched on the top of the highest mountain in the kingdom, and it appeared as though it were cut from the very mountain itself, surrounded by a thick green forest filled with dangerous wild creatures. Only since he'd been forced to spend his life hidden within its wretched walls and on its grounds had he done such things as take in his surroundings this way, actually see, and indeed feel them. He now contemplated the moonlight casting sinister shadows on the statues that flanked the path leading from the castle to his garden. Large winged creatures, more frightening than anything from the ancient stories the tutors of his youth had made him study. He couldn't recall these sculptures being there before the castle and its lands were enchanted. There had been many changes since the witches had brought their enchantments. The topiaries, for example, seemed to snarl at him as he prowled the labyrinth on evenings like this attempting to take his mind off his troubles. He had long since gotten used to the statues, watchful eyes glancing at him when he wasn't looking at them directly, and their slight movements he caught only out of the corner of his eye. He couldn't escape the feeling of being watched, and had almost gotten used to it, almost, and the grand entrance to his castle seemed to him like a gaping mouth prepared to devour him. He spent as much time outdoors as possible. The castle felt like a prison. As large as it was, it confined him, choking the life out of him, once when he was still, dare he think it, human. He spent much of his time out of doors, stalking wild beasts in his forest for sport. But when he himself turned into something to be hunted, he shut himself away. In those first years, never leaving the West Wing, let alone the castle. Perhaps that was why he now detested being within doors. He had once spent so much time locked away by his own fear. When the castle was first enchanted, he thought that his mind was playing tricks on him, that simply the idea of the curse had driven him mad. But he now knew everything that surrounded him was alive, and he was fearful. Any further misdeeds on his part would send it into a frenzy, and his enemies would make him suffer even more for the pain he had caused so many before he became a beast. The physical transformation was only part of the curse. There was much more, and it was far too frightening to think of. Right now, he wanted to think of the only thing that could calm him, even slightly. He wanted to think of her, Belle. He looked upon the lake to the right of the garden. The moon created beautiful silver patterns on the rippling water. Apart from his thoughts of Belle, this was the only tranquility he had been afforded since the curse. He spent many hours here, careful not to catch sight of his own reflection, though sometimes he was tempted. He was fully aware of the revulsion it would bring. He had been almost obsessed with his reflection when the curse began to take hold, and he quite liked the little changes in his appearance at first. The deep lines he mused had made his young face more fearsome to his enemies. But now, now, that the curse had overtaken him completely, he couldn't stand the sight of himself. Every mirror in the castle had been broken or shut away in the west wing. 
His terrible deeds were engraved on his face, and that sent a hollow, wretched feeling deep into his gut, sickening him. But enough of that. He had a beautiful woman within his walls. She was a willing captive, someone to talk to, and yet he couldn't even bring himself to face her. Fear. It gripped him again. Would his fear now keep him outside, where once it had shut him in? Fear of going within doors and facing the girl? She was a wise woman. Had she no idea his fate was in her hands? The statues watched, as they always did, when he heard the click of tiny boots on the stone path heading in his direction, disturbing his musings. The Odd Sisters, Lucinda, Ruby, and Martha, an indistinguishable trio of witches, with inky black ringlets, a milky parlor with the texture of bleached driftwood, and red baby doll lips were standing before him in his rose garden. Their faces were glowing in the moonlight, like those of ghosts with mocking expressions. Their finery glittered like stardust in the dark garden, while the plumage in their hair made their bird-like gestures all the more grotesque. There was a nervousness about them. They were seized by a constant series of little twitches and gestures, as if they were in continuous communication with each other, even when they weren't speaking. They seemed to be taking measure of him, and he let them. He stood in silence, as he often did when they came to him, waiting for them to speak. They appeared whenever they pleased, and always without warning. Never mind it was his castle and his garden. He had long before given up on insisting that they appeared his will. He soon discovered his own desires were of no consequence to them. Their laughs were shrill, and seemed to mock the tiny glimmer of hope the witches detected within his dark and lonely heart. Lucinda was the first to speak, as was their custom. He couldn't help being transfixed by her face when she spoke to him. She looked like an old doll come to life, with her porcelain skin and ratty clothes. An unfaltering, monotone voice only made the scene more macabre. So, you've captured yourself a pretty little thing at long last. He didn't bother asking how they knew Belle had come to his castle. He had his theories on how they always seemed to know everything about him, but didn't care to share them with the sisters. "'We're surprised, Beast,' said Martha, her pale blue eyes watery and globe-like. "'Yes, surprised,' Ruby spat with an eerie wide grin, animating her two red lips morbidly, like a dead creature brought to life by evil incantations. "'We expected your condition to have progressed by now,' said Lucinda, her head cocked slightly to the right while she looked at him. "'We dreamed of you running in the woods hunting smaller prey.' Ruby continued, We dreamed of hunters tracking you down. Martha laughed and said, Hunting you like the beast you are, and mounting your head on the huntsman's tavern wall. Why, Why you're, you're even wearing, wearing clothes, we see. see. Holding on to, to the last shred of your humanity, humanity, is it? They said in unison. The beast did nothing to betray his terror. Terror not of the witch's magic, but of his own threatening nature, of which they were reminding him. They were holding a mirror up to the monster within, which was longing to escape. It was a beast that wanted to kill the witches and everything else in its path. He longed to see blood and bones, to taste their flesh. If he tore at their throats with his claws, he'd never have to listen to their shrill, taunting voices again. Lucinda laughed. Now that is what we expected of you, beast. And Martha said, He will never capture Belle's heart, sister no matter how desperate he is to break the curse. He's too far gone now, I dare say. Perhaps, if we show her how he looked once, she may have pity on him, Ruby said, as a maddening cacophony of laughter filled the rose garden. Pity him, yes, but love him, never. The beast used to hurl insults back at all of them, but it seemed only to fuel their passion for cruelty and he didn't dare stir up his own anger and desire for violence. So he just stood stock still, waiting for their little torture session to end. Martha spoke again. In case you've forgotten, here are the rules, beast, laid out by all the sisters. You must love her, and that love must be returned with true love's kiss before your twenty-first birthday. She may use the mirror, as you do, to see into the world beyond your kingdom, but she must never know the details of the curse or how it is to be broken. 
You will notice she sees the castle and its enchantments differently than yourself. The most terrifying aspects of the curse are reserved for you. The beast stared blankly at the witches. Martha smiled creepily and continued. This is your one advantage. The only thing in this castle, or in its grounds that will frighten Belle, is your visage. Lucinda chimed in. When was the last time you looked upon your reflection, beast, or saw to the rose? There had been a time when the rose wasn't out of his sight. Lately he tried to forget it. He'd almost expected the sister's visit this evening would be to inform him that the last petal had fallen off its enchanted stem. But they were just here to mock him, as always, to tempt him into violence, and they'd love nothing more than to see his soul further besmirched. Lucinda's cackling voice brought him out of his reverie. It won't be long now, Martha continued. Not long at all, beast. Soon the last petal will fall, and you shall remain in this form, with no chance of transformation, to your former self. And on that day, we, we will, will dance. dance, they finished in unison. The beast finally spoke. And what of the others? Are they to remain as they are, doomed to enchantment as well? Ruby's eyes widened in wonder. Concern? Is that what we detect? Isn't that odd? Concern for himself? Yes, for himself. Always himself. Never others. Why would he concern himself with servants? He never gave them a second thought unless it was to punish them. I think he's afraid of what they might do to him if he doesn't break the curse. I think you're right, sister. I'm also interested in seeing what they'll do. It shall be a gruesome spectacle indeed, and we shall take much pleasure in bearing witness to it. Don't forget, beast, true love, both given and received, before the last petal falls. And with that, the sisters turned on the heels of their tiny pointed boots and clicked their way out of the rose garden, the sound fading little by little until they vanished into a sudden mist and the beast could no longer hear them at all. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this reading. If you haven't had a chance to, please take a second, like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, comment down below, share with a friend, and check out some of the other villain series chapters and books as well. Join us next time. And remember, let it go and keep moving forward. Have a magical day. Bye.